to ask questions or make comments as I go, don't hesitate to stick your hand up. I'm very happy to, to, to talk at, uh, during my presentation. Um, so, uh, Blast Theory is a group of, of three artists. I've been working with Duro Bar and Nick Kandavanich since 1991. And uh, part of the ways in which we make our work is um, in collaboration with other partners, particularly the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. Um, the, 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 the MRL is a, a, a lab uh, of interdisciplinary researchers looking at the boundaries <coughs> between real and virtual space. And um, a lot of the work that we have made has been facilitated by the partnership that we have with them. But we partner with lots of, uh, uh, of different organizations, um, uh, some in higher education, some commercial partners within research relationships. So sometimes we're funded to, to undertake research in particular areas um, like pervasive games or uh, outside broadcasting would be, would be two examples. This is our studio uh, in Brighton, where we have been based since uh, 2005. Um, some of the sort of threads that run through the work we make, some of the things that motivate the work that we're making, is uh, it, it, it's, it's around the, the, the explosion of, uh, of interaction and participation. Um, so sometimes people call that digital, some people call that a technology, don't you see that technology lens. If you're making live work, which is our background, how do you how do you respond to uh, a, an era in which interaction and participation are the kind of default modes of how we are increasingly interacting with the world around us and culture in particular? Uh, and the way in which we are interested to do, to do that is through creating conversations with strangers and looking at multiple different ways of doing that. And I'm going to show three projects this afternoon that will kind of show perhaps a sort of diversity of, of ways in which, which we set about doing that. So obviously that's partly about technology. It's also partly about <coughs> games and thinking about games as an art form. Some of the work that we have made is, is directly um, uh, uh, structured as a game, sometimes online games or mobile games or mixed reality games where people are playing online and on the street at the same time. Uh, and, and other works are game-like or playful in some way, and some uh, are, are not in any way at all. And we've often um, uh, put our work out into public space, and that public space might be online, but it might also be the street and, and, and public space in the city. And so you see that in this photo here. This is a, a piece of work that we made. Uh, this photo is taken in Cologne. Uh, it's, it's a game we, we, we played called Can You See Me Now, uh, where people are playing online and on the street, and this, this street player is being kind of chased by these kids who've all decided to, to join in. Um, just sort of some brief kind of uh, milestones in, 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 in historical terms. It's in 1998 we made this work, Kidnap, where we ran a lottery in England and Wales where you paid £10 to enter, and the first and second prize in that lottery was to be kidnapped by us and held for two days at uh, a, a secret location. And this is Russell, who um, was one of the people we kidnapped. Russell chose the Red Army faction, or Eamon Collins, who was a member of the IRA. And, and as you walk through the city, you are kind of, in, in, sort of inducted into, into the role of being either Ulrika or Eamon. You choose who you want to be. And the work kind of culminates with a, you can see it on Amazon or Spotify or Netflix or any other kind of, any of those other kind of services. Partly what they're doing is saying, I know you and I know what you'd like and here's something that you might like. And when that works, when that's done effectively, it's a tremendously satisfying and pleasing thing. And, in, and that's, for me, that felt like that's the, the trade-off that we're willing to make when we know that then our data is also being... The, the piece of work we made is a smartphone app. It's still available for iOS and for Android. Uh, if you look for Karen uh, is my life coach, you will find it. And, and when, you, when you launch the app, it's um, almost like a, a, a video calling type interface, and you meet this, this person here, this is Karen, played by uh, actress Claire Page, and she's uh, a life coach, and she offers to, to help you with some things in your life, and says, you know, what do you want to work on, do you want to work on career or family, and um, you, you interact with her, and tell her the things that you're interested in, and over the next 10 days, through about 20 episodes that last between two and six minutes long each, you, you have conversations with Karen, and um, Questions that she has for you, she gives you feedback. The kind
kind of twist to it is that within a short period of time it becomes clear that Karen's not quite the professional life coach that she appears to be initially and that her life is a little bit rocky and you start to see her home life and then you catch her in her dressing gown and she's not quite dressed and then she takes you <coughs> and shows you around the corner of, the, of, of her flatmate's door and you see him sat naked playing games, you know, playing up on his phone and, you know, the, it's, it's a, 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 you know, a classic internet story of, of you can write literally anywhere in any direction, as far or as, or as, uh, as near as you like. Uh, and, and you can also listen to the recordings that have been left by the loads of false branches that are sort of pretending to give you choice, but of course they're rapidly hurrying you back. So from our point of view, we, we just don't play that game. Yeah. We go to something where you're not necessarily even aware of when you have made a choice or in how, the, how the story has fought slightly. And it may just be that Karen is just a little bit chillier with you today than she was yesterday because of how you behaved yesterday or what you said to her. So it seems like shot the number of times with Karen behaving a bit differently. Yeah. Did the same stuff Exactly. I'll show I'll show a little clip of video in a second, which will give us some idea of that. It's a combination of things where you kind of see the joins, but then we work very hard to do loads of hidden edits. So there are loads of places where you know we, we, we're using a whip hand to engage with, with with them in conversation. Can you actually find out uh, what national listeners are doing? So you're put in this very difficult position where you have to echo their views in order to 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 progress. Um, and there's a, there is a kind of game-like structure, which is people who are particularly good at doing that will sometimes get invited to meet one of the two founders of National Resistance, um, as, as you see in this, this photo here. So the sort of background of this work was, as we started to, we, it was originally the undercover policing scandal. I'm sure some of you will be familiar about, familiar with this, um, particularly Bob Lambert, uh, an undercover police officer who had a sexual relationship with a woman who he was, who was targeting and then uh, uh, had a child with her and then at the end of his, um, his, his, his tour of duty um, faked a mental illness and vanished never to be seen again leaving her alone with this baby and never knowing uh, what happened to him and it was only 10 or, 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 or more years later that this scandal broke and she realised that Bob Lambert had been an undercover officer using her to get to friends of hers. She herself was not a direct target of the surveillance operation. She was just uh, trusted by the people he was trying to surveil. So, um, so, so the, 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 the kind of um, the crimes of, of, of the men in particular as undercover police officers was, was part of the starting point from this and the complexities of how you run undercover policing because every, every democracy in the world runs undercover police units um, so the question is, is how do you actually do that in any kind of ethical or constrained way when it's entirely based on perception? To, to the highest level she can to give her a good chance of getting through the training. So, that, so this fundraiser is happening and then you're aware that within this, this, this fundraiser a number of people are from national resistance. Uh, and in this photo here you see uh, a member of the audience on the right hand side meeting uh, 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 Amin who's one of the one of the persons of interest, and um, it becomes clear that um, that this this splinter group, uh, um, th these people come from a whole range of different backgrounds. What unites them is um, is, is a strong opposition to immigration uh, uh, and a, a strong um, uh, uh, xenophobia. Um, but each of them have different reasons for for why they believe in what they believe in, and. Uh, uh, only through building trust with them and, and um, uh, um, being willing to engage with, with, with them in conversation can you actually find out uh, what national resistance are doing. So you're put in this very difficult position where you have to echo their views in order to, to, to progress. Um, and there's a, there is a kind of game-like structure which is people who are particularly good at doing that will sometimes get invited to meet one of the two founders of National Resistance, um, as, as you see in this, this photo here. So the sort of background to this work was, as we started to, we was originally the undercover policing scandal, I'm sure some of you will be familiar, about, familiar with this, um, particularly Bob Lambert, uh, an undercover police officer 
who had a sexual relationship with a woman who he was, who was targeting and then uh, uh, had a child with her and then at the end of his, um, his, his, his tour of duty um, faked a mental illness and vanished, never to be seen again, leaving her alone with this baby and never knowing uh, what happened to him. And it was only 10 or, 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 or more years later that this scandal broke and she realized that Bob Lannenberg had been an undercover officer using her to get to friends of hers. She herself was not a direct target of the surveillance operation. She was just uh, trusted by the people he was trying to surveil. So, um, so, so the, 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 the kind of um, the crimes of, of, of the Met in particular as undercover police officers was, was part of the starting point from this and the complexities of how you run undercover policing, because every, every democracy in the world runs undercover police units. Um, so the question is, is how do you actually do that in any kind of ethical or constrained way when it's entirely based on deception? It was something that was, um, became very interesting to us. And, and the flip side of that was looking at the, at the rise of the far right. And um, uh, this is, of course, you know, in, in a, a pre-Brexit situation, realizing that when, when we started to look at the far right, realizing that um, it was much more diverse a, a group of people than you would anticipate. It was people of all ages, all backgrounds, and various ethnicities were supporters of the English Defence League, of Britain First, of other, other anti-immigration groups. This is the kind of um, the, the, the stereotypical image of the far right, which is that you would know them every time you saw them. They're a bunch of meathead uh, uh, um, uh, men, uh, skinhead men who are who look tall up for violence. Actually, the the far right is is a is a much more pluralistic picture than the media shorthand shows us. And um, uh, uh, so we wanted to, to to kind of put you in a position of of finding finding out um, that the people who are in this far right group are are, are much more. Um, they're unexpected in terms of some of their reasons. They're not, they don't meet your stereotypical views. I'm going to stop there. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. This is a very, very quick opportunity for you to grab another drink. And then we'll start straight away here with a conversation. So those of you that are near the wall, you might want to come slightly closer. Um, we'll start straight away, but if you want to, feel free to grab a drink on the side. Hello. Shaji Marabala, and I am the co-founder of ZU UK, together with George. And um, this next part is really a kind of conversation, um, an open conversation between us all, but because we're two and that <coughs> is only one, I thought perhaps I'd take more of a kind of questioner type, postie type role um, for the next part, although, you know, it's quite open to um, so I've got some questions to kick off with, but I'm also really happy to take questions from the audience as opposed to leave that to the last thing. That, that's what normally happens. Um, but did you want to say more about when we started? No, just to, uh, I know some people walked in and then some people walked out, so this might be a different demographic than it was about 15 minutes ago. So quick hello, we're doing um, a talk with Matt and hosting a conversation. Judge and I, directors of ZG UK and Matt of Blast Theory, and we'll follow, we'll follow this uh, conversation and Q&A with 12 s very small performances by the MA Contemporary Performance Practices, as well as MA Acting and Directing here at UEL upstairs. 
Uh, and if you want to ask any questions later, we'll be around for quite a while, so just grab us in the corridor between performances. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so uh, because we're you know, in this context that the university and stuff and because of the students that we're working with, I wanted to start off with something that was, I think, pertinent to, to this audience group um, for both of you, um, which was really about what challenges you see that younger artists are having to face today that we ourselves didn't have to face, you know, about 20 20 odd years ago and my experience, my feeling is that when we were creating the kind of work that we do now, but at that time, um, there wasn't much interest in it and that meant that there was lots more room for failure. You know, there was a lot more room to make mistakes and you kind of earned your stripes um, by going along and making failure in public, which seems to me today not to be able to happen so much. I don't know what you think or if you agree or... Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I'm the one, young one of the tribe. <laughs> um, but if, if you look at somewhere like uh, Edinburgh Fringe, for example, and we've had three interactions with it across the 15 years that we've been making work, um, and the more or less five years apart, and my first experience with it was somewhere, you know, already overcrowded and, and busy and hard to get a message across or try to get people to see your work if you're not known at all. But it seems that it can get bigger and bigger. It can just continue to expand and become somewhere where the human scale is no longer kind of... I find it even hard to consider the size of it. Uh, I think that would be the, the kind of biggest place as a metaphor for how hard it must be to start today to try and get any space in terms of media, uh, awareness about work they might be doing um, at all in a place like that. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I suppose you know, what, what's clear is that for, for, for younger artists now, the financial pressures are much, much greater. Uh, you have a much greater level of debt, you have much higher living expenses in, 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 as a proportion of your, uh, uh, of your income. Uh, but I do think it's worth reminding people who might not know that the 80s and the early 90s were a very brutal period in many ways for arts and culture in this country. Um, you know, the, the, the arts funding was cut consistently through the 80s and the early 90s to a really very, very low level. And then in 1991, which is the year that I graduated, which is why I remember it so vividly, there was a, a very brutal recession, um, uh, certainly the equal of the, of the financial crisis. <coughs> Of 2008-9, and in some ways more pro a, a greater, more profound um, crisis because it uh, affected people's housing um, so much. So, um, you know that there are there, there are always those kinds of challenges. I, I think that you know the people who the younger artists who we work with today, and you know we have a residency program, so we have a fairly um, good stream of people. In fact, one of our ex-residents, Aliyah Mansour, is here tonight. Nice to see you, Aliyah. Uh, uh, so you could probably talk about being a younger artist better than I could, uh, uh, Aliyah. But I, I think that um, you know that you just you have to be very agile in terms of the work that you make. And lots of people I know who are making work as younger artists ha are having to do that alongside either full-time jobs or near full-time jobs, and they're having to try and to try and balance that. But in terms of kind of failure, I think that it's still perfectly okay to make loads of failures. I think you're only, you know, you're remembered for your successes, and and uh, you know, it seems catastrophic to make a failure, but but we've made plenty, and the, you know, you, 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 they just they gradually sink beneath the waves, and, and you know, and the, the key is about how you can how you can um, uh, find the, the the kind of resources to continue making work, and you must. You must just be incredibly tenacious and bloody-minded about keeping making work, even if that's making things that are a tabletop in scale, because that's all you have. You must then continue to, to do that. I think that's the, you know, the, 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 the thing.
thing that I try and encourage people to do all of the time is, is that even if you have graduated and are now in debt and are trying for, to find work and are under pressure in terms of housing, and you know, to, to, to find a mechanism through which you can at least continue your practice, if at all possible, that's the, that's the goal. Thank you. I'm going to uh, open up to any questions from the audience. It's possible to survive um, in or uh, as a as a company sort of starting out. I appreciate your thought further down the line. But do you think it's possible to uh, to make it without funding? Because that is very much something in my world. Uh, there's a lot of companies that we can keep with, and I'm I'm I don't disagree with funding, but I would rather try and make my own work off my own back if I could. Um, but that's been proving increasingly difficult. I'm just wondering what you think the chances are of making work without that, particularly on the scale that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think you, 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 it's different for, it's always different for different artists, different <laughs> backgrounds, you know, it's like, I, I had loads of advantages, I come from a middle class background, I had all of, I went to university, I had all of those advantages behind me, so I always, I'm very conscious of the fact that I speak from a very particular position, um, but I think that um, there are loads of different ways to make work, and, and, and that it, to get into a thing of like, oh, well, like, until, until we get funding, we can't really move and we'll apply and oh, we didn't get it, so now we can't do that. If you get into that mindset too much, that can be a problem. So in the first, the very first show we ever made, um, we, we, we hired a, a, um, a, a Sunday school hall in Islington for not very much money. We then bought loads of bottles of beer from, from, a, from a wholesaler and we ran the bar ourselves I got my mum to cook flapjacks, and we sold flapjacks. You know, we did all of those kinds of things. We sold the tickets ourselves. We ran the box office ourselves. Were you a Boy Scout, <laughs> Well, it was, it, we, came for, we came out of uh, an era of being influenced by um, the, the independent record label scene. You know, if you, if you want to study about how to do it, if you look at what happened in the post-punk period in the late 70s and early 80s, how people, how the music industry said, Fuck the majors, we can make music ourselves, this is how we're going to do it. It's an incredibly inspiring story because those people had no resources. And they set up record labels, they worked out how to do rec press their own records, etc. etc. And you see it in the music scene today. There is loads of an entrepreneur people with entrepreneurial spirit spirit. And I think it's you know, sometimes people in the artistic side feel that there's a route towards success and that funding is a sort of sign of credibility and it's a, it's a sign of, of making it and moving forwards. And they, they, you, you can be tempted to kind of prioritize that as if that's the, the metric by which you know that you're making progress. And I don't think you need to do that. I think you can find ways of, 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 of being resourceful to make your own work. And you can definitely see if you look at America where there is no funding and almost every single person who's making work is running a full-time job and then they're rehearsing in the evenings and so on. You, you, can, you can do that, you know, and I don't mean to say that glibly as like, oh well, everyone just buck up and get on with it. It is tough, especially for independent artists. It's, I'm not meaning to, 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 to diminish the challenge, but I, am, I would really encourage you to, to, to look for mechanisms that enable you to get on and, and, and make work without money. If, if money is the barrier, there are, there, then, then there are there may be ways in which you can you can circumvent that. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we tend to discuss with the artist to a mentor at gas station is how can you expand the notion of your practice beyond arts, which it can be helpful in articulating the value of what you do in a number of different environments. And if you can create, and if you really are interested in not looking at arts funding at all, which is in, in itself quite an interesting uh, understanding of the independence of your work and, and how to create a business structure or a kind of ecosystem around you, either of collaboration or other uh, ways to, to bring income to make your work, that could uh, be an essential part of your work as opposed to the side thing that generates money so you can do your work. Uh, by no means is that easy. It's hard enough to make work that's any good. And then on top of that, you're trying to rethink your work as a value for another organization or industry. But if you manage to, normally the value you get for that bit of work that you do 
and, and the kind of interest and the, and the uh, status in the boat, 19 meters long. And then we asked a group of volunteers to come with us and pull it out of the sea by hand. So this is what you see in this photo. And then um, it, was, it was driven in procession through the city at night and, and offloaded in the, in the middle of the night with a massive crane with floodlights and lowered into position. And then the following day, we asked those volunteers to come back and to push the boat into position. And um, the, the, the engineers who were, were helping with this project assured us that it wouldn't be possible to move a boat of that scale with, with, with uh, um, just people pushing it. Um, and this, uh, this is a piece of video documentation from this work. So the, 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 that, that piece of film forms a section of a longer 10 minute film that we made about this process. And then the finished work itself was that boat installed in that place right in the center of the city on one of the busiest road junctions. Uh, and as you visited the boat, you were then given a, 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 um, a tablet <coughs> with a pair of headphones and you watched the film as you walked around this boat itself and, and, and looked up at it. And the, the, the film told the story of this process, but it also told the story of a number of other uh, uh, natural disasters over the course of the 20th century, and uh, it, particularly drawing on research from a book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, that tells the story of how ordinary men and women do by far the greatest amount of work in relation to natural disasters, and that generally this is overlooked and under-acknowledged because the journalists and the emergency services arrive together, sometimes minutes, normally hours, sometimes even days later, by which time all of that work has already been done. So what you find is that when you go into a granular level and do a research around a disaster like that tsunami, thousands of lives are saved by ordinary men and women doing, taking immediate action in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the seconds and minutes after an actual disaster like that, and that this is just then overlooked. It, it, the perception is, uh, as, the, as the emergency services arrive, that, that they are the cavalry coming to the rescue of, of a population that is shell-shocked and has no idea what's going on. And in reality, that's not really true. It's, the, it, it's a much more complex picture than that. Um, so the second work that I'd like to, to, to talk about is, um, is, is a project called Karen. Um, it's uh, a commission for National Theatre of Wales. Um, and John McGrath, who's the Artistic Director of National Theatre of Wales, approached us and said, we'd like to work with you. What's a project that you would like to do? And at that stage, we had no real idea of what shape of work we wanted to make. But um, this is in about 2012, 2013. We'd become very interested in, um, in social, uh, um, uh, in online tracking, and, and particularly how social media tracks, tracks you. Um, obviously, this is something that we are more aware of now than we were then. But what um, interested me in particular was um, not so much that this tracking was going on, it was to do with how relaxed so many people were about this tracking. And I was very interested to, to kind of explore what that solipsism is, what is that self-gratification uh, we get about a system that seems to know about us, that it's actually quite a pleasing thing when a system knows our preferences and understands us in some way and reflects back to us something about ourselves. And we see that, you know, to me, that's, that's how all of these platforms, not just in social media, but you can see it in Amazon or Spotify or Netflix or any, other kind of, any of those other kinds of services, partly what they're doing is saying, I know you and I know what you'd like and here's something that you might like. 
And when that works, when that's done effectively, it's a tremendously satisfying and pleasing thing. And, in, and that's, for me, that felt like that's the, the trade-off that we're willing to make when we know that then our data is also being, being collected, is that when that's done effectively, we really don't, don't care. And um, you know, during, during this particular period of development of this project, Amazon went from being the, the darling to being really well understood as to what actually its practices meant in terms of labor conditions, in terms of tax, in terms of data scraping and so on. And I was um, full of enthusiasm that, that people would turn away from Amazon in droves and how wrong I was to believe that that was going to happen. And uh, Amazon has, of course, gone from strength to strength right through that period. Those revelations have not dented their growth in any significant way whatsoever. So the, the piece of work that we made is a smartphone app. It's still available for iOS and for Android. Uh, if you look for Karen uh, is my life coach, you will find it. And, and when, you, when you launch the app, it's um, almost like a, a video calling type interface. And you meet this, this person here. This is Karen, played by uh, actress Claire Cage. And she's uh, a life coach, and she offers to, to help you with some things in your life and says, you know, what do you want to work on? Do you want to work on career or family? And um, you, you interact with her and tell her the things that you're interested in. And over the next 10 days, through about 20 episodes that last between two and six minutes long each, you, you have conversations with Karen and, um, and, and uh, give, you know, answer questions that she has for you. And she gives you feedback. The kind of twist to it is that within a short period of time, it becomes clear that Karen's not quite <coughs> the professional life coach that she appears to be initially, and that her life is a little bit rocky, and you start to see her home life, and then you catch her in her dressing gown when she's not quite dressed, and then she takes you <coughs> and shows you around the corner of, the, of, of her flatmate's door, and you see him sat naked playing, you know, playing on his phone. And you know the, it's a, it's a, a, um, a you know a, a classic internet story of, of, of boundaries being uh, flouted, um, and uh, uh, what what gradually becomes uh, apparent is that every single question that Karen asks you is taken from a psychological profiling questionnaire or or, or test psychometric test and in the background the app is gathering all of that data and is psychologically profiling you running you against these psychological profiling tests <coughs> and the story is adapting to you based on its assessment of you on a number of psychological scales like uh, neuroticism or extroversion conscientiousness for example so I thought it might be useful just to sort of yeah Sorry. Um, so, so No, so, so, so the story itself changes very little. What changes is Karen's relationship to you and her attitude towards you. So it's much more about an emotional relationship and how that is, it's, it's, it's folded around the data. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer at all in branching narratives and this idea that, you know, what you want is an interactive story that goes one way if you choose one thing and another way if you choose another. Why? To me well, because they, um, they're, they're tremendously reductive and ultimately less interesting. You know, it's like that sense of taking a plot in a very particular direction. You know, it, 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 if it's to be done in any meaningful way, you need exponential number of options. You know, if you, if you give someone an A or B option eight times, you have 1,024 options at the eighth step. So, so no one can realistically produce an interesting story with 1,024 options. So if you give someone eight A or B choices, you're already beyond the scale of what you can reasonably deliver in terms of a compelling and interesting story. So, so then what people actually do with those interactive narratives is there are loads of false branches that are sort of pretending to give you choice, but of course they're rapidly hurrying you back. So from our point of view, we, we just don't play that game. We go with something where you're not necessarily even aware of when you have made a choice or in how the how the story has, has forked slightly. And it may just be that Karen is just a little bit chillier with you today than she was yesterday because of how you behaved yesterday or what you said to her. So were those scenes like shot a number of times with 
can behave in a bit differently with yeah. the same stuff happening. Exactly. I'll show I'll show a little clip of video in a second which will give some idea of that. It's a combination of things where you can kind of see the joins, but then we work very hard to do loads of hidden edits. So there are loads of places where you know we, we, we're using a whip pan with the camera as a way to hide edits and so on. So so there are there are branching elements, but it's um, it, it's it's not necessarily clear or immediately apparent how that's how that's operating. So just I just thought it might be useful just with this project to just talk a little bit about the research story um, and how how we kind of came to make that piece of work and why we sort of chose that form. So early on in that process, we get interested in this idea of, 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 of big data and you know the idea that co the companies are now capturing data on us and are processing that. And we kind of go back trying to look for some of the roots of that. And one of them is coming back to this thing. This is a, a system by Experian. I, I presume a lot of people might be familiar with Experian, a data uh, company looking at credit scores. And they have a system called Mosaic, which is basically, based on your postcode, they can tell you a tremendous amount about the people who live in that postcode. And they used to have, for a little while, they had a free, a, a free app where you could actually do this for yourself. And it was a party game of mine for about six months to say, what's your postcode? <laughs> Put it into the app and then say, so you are, and then read back to them. And it was shocking how accurate it was. I mean, really quite you know, uncanny. It's like one of those things where it shouldn't work, you know, you, but it really, really quite does. Um, and uh, we, but sort of as we started to get into that, we kind of realized that we really needed to to, 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 to learn a lot more about this and you know, sort of our, our sense of our ignorance about this project, you know, about this process was really kind of growing. We suddenly were like, wow, this is massive. So one of the things that we did was start to work with Dr. Kelly Page, who's a researcher, uh, now, now based in Chicago. Um, a, a, another researcher called Geraldine Nichols did fantastic work.